All right, are there any questions? So last time we finished our discussion of classification, right? And you guys should be having the lectures also by now, right? I sent it out yesterday uh, on on Tuesday itself, right? So any any questions on classification, right? So if there are no questions on classification, next we'll move on to clustering, right? So in classification, what you're trying to do is like you're given, you have, let's say, two different classes. There could be more, right? And given a new sample, you're trying to put it into an appropriate class, all right? In clustering, you have a bunch of points, right? And you want to break it up into groups, right? Into different clusters. So a cluster operator takes a set of data points and partitions the points into clusters or subsets, right? Uh, clustering has become a popular data analysis technique in genomic studies using gene expression microarrays because you might take the microarray data. Remember, I, I talked about, you know, at each spot on the microarray, right, you might have a 1, 0, or minus 1, right? So you might want to cluster, you know, different samples, right, based on the, on the patterns that you see on the microarray, right? Uh, in addition, time series clustering, like you could, you could be looking at time series data, you could be taking measurements at different points in time, right? and see the bunch of genes that go up and down together, right? So that might allow you to do another kind of clustering. So time series clustering groups together genes whose expression levels exhibit similar, similar behavior through time, right? And similarity in behavior uh, indicates possible co-regulation. That means those genes might be controlled by some other master gene, right? And they're going up and down at the same time. Uh, another way to use expression data is to take expression profiles over various tissue samples, right? And then cluster those samples based on the expression levels for each sample, right? And the hope is that, you know, uh, if you have like two different kinds of tumors, right, that are generating those samples, when you look at the gene expressions, right, and you do the clustering, you'll separate out the two different tumors, right? Now, Classification, which we have already discussed, exhibits two fundamental char characteristics, right? And again, to know more about classification, I would recommend that you take uh, the 649 course next semester, right? Pattern recognition that is taught by Dr. Braganito, all right? That should be a good course because I have just given you the big picture, but if you want to get into the details of all this error estimation and so on, right, he's going to cover those things, all right? But anyway, the classification exhibits two fundamental characteristics, right? The first one is that the classifier error can be estimated under the assumption that the sample data arise from an underlying feature label distribution. And we talked a lot about that last time, right? The estimation of the error and, uh, you know, the different methods like leave, leave one out estimation, cross-validation, resubstitution, and so on, okay? Also, another thing is that given a family of classifiers, you can use sample data to learn the optimal classifier in the family, right? Remember, if you didn't have any constraints, the family was a set of all possible classifiers, right, on... on D feature variables, right? And in that case, we got the base classifier is the best one, but we don't have the base classifier because we don't have those conditional probabilities, right? So we can learn the base classifier, right? And get close to it as the number of samples goes up. So in classification, once you've designed a classifier, the classifier actually represents a mathematical model that provides a decision mechanism relative to real world measurements because you take the measurements of the feature vector, right? The classifier is going to spit out a class label zero or one, right? Or if you have, you know, multiple classes, then there could be more labels too, right? So the, anyway, the bottom line is that the model represents scientific knowledge to the extent that it has got predictive capability, and the purpose of testing or error estimation is to quantify the worth of the model, right? That means how good is your classifier, right, that, that you have designed, right? Now, unfortunately, in clustering, you don't have any of those guarantees. Clustering is very much like an art, right? It's not like a science. There is a lot of heuristics, right? And you will see by the time I get to the end of this lecture exactly what I mean, right? So clustering lacks both fundamental characteristics of classification. Many validation techniques have been proposed for evaluating clustering results, right? And these are generally based on the degree to which clusters derive from a set of sample data satisfy certain heuristic criteria, right? So this is significantly different than classification, where the error of the classifier, what was the error of the classifier? That was the probability of misclassification, right? We covered that last time, right? And uh, the following figure will show you, you know, why cl uh, clustering is kind of problematic, right? It's, it's uh, based on heuristics. Like, so here you have a bunch of points, right, in these two figures, right? You have the same set of points, both on the left as well as on the right, right? 
But somebody could come in and say there are three clusters here, group one, group two, and group three, right? On the other hand, somebody might, might come else might come and say that there are two, only two clusters, group one and then group two, right? Which one do you choose, right? So it's based on heuristics, right? There's no clear answer. So here, both the clusters appear to be reasonable, but the performance of a clustering algorithm cannot be measured by just observing the results of a single application, like one single set of data points, like here, okay? You cannot, go, let's say your first clustering algorithm picked up this one, the second one picked up this one, right? Just based on this, you cannot say that this one is better than that or vice versa, right? So you have a problem here because you have to do it on a number of samples, right? So rather, as with classification, the performance must be measured relative to predictive results on a distribution, right? And for clustering, error estimation must assume that clusters resulting from a cluster algorithm can be compared to the correct clusters for the data set, right? In the context of some probability distribution, thereby providing an error measure, right? And the key to doing all of this stuff, right, uh, to this general probabilistic theory of clustering, that means a more rigorous theory of clustering, which we are not going to do here because this is not a course on pattern recognition. It is not a course on clustering, right? This is a course on engineering methods that are going to be used in plant genomics, right? We are now covering engineering methods. We've covered some genomics. We still have more territory to cover. There's plant genomics that is coming up, right? So we don't have time to do all of that stuff. But even in that area, it's not very, things are not that well established. But if you, if you want to do a rigorous theory, then you have to do uh, the theory based on operators on random sets, right? Because in the case of classification, it's it's, it's a theory, right? Remember, we use all those probabilities, but those are like you're trying to construct operators that operate on random variables, right? Those features that you observe, those are random variables, right? You're looking at the feature lab, uh, then label distribution and so on, right? So similarly for clustering also, you can develop that kind of theory, right? Uh, I don't know to what extent it has been practically applied, right? But you can develop that, right? Uh, but it will be based on more sophisticated mathematics, not just on random variables. You have to look at theory of random sets, right? And we don't want to get into any of that, right? Because we have too many other things to, to do here. So instead of, of trying to develop a you know, rigorous theory of clustering, all right, in this course, we will just look at some popular clustering algorithms, all right? And these are, again, based on heuristics, but they work well most of the time. Okay. So let's look at a few examples of clustering algorithms. All right, any questions so far? The first example, right, of a clustering algorithm is what is called the k-means algorithm, right? So, so here you have a bunch of points, right, and you want to break it up into k classes, let's say, all right? So, so you, so you, so you have a bunch of points x, all right, and you want to break it from a from a sample s. And uh, you want to, oh, I'm sorry, it's M, M of that. You're looking at M classes. So it, this should have been M means or, you know, uh, K means is because usually you assume that there are going to be K classes, right? So the notes should have been written out with K over here instead of M. But anyway, that's, I, I'm just pointing that out right now. So let's say there are M classes. So I should have said like M means, okay? But, you know, if you go and look in the literature, it's always referred to as K means, right? Because so there are K classes. So how do you figure out uh, I mean, so, so how do you come up with the, with the k-means algorithm, right? So the idea is the following, right? You are going to pick some, uh, so, so, you, so you have these different classes, okay, one through m, all right? So for each class, right, you're choosing a centroid, all right? So suppose this, you, you have points A0s, A1s, up to AM minus 1s. So you have M points, which, are, which you're thinking of as the centroids of each of these classes, right? Then this, this quantity, this metric here, okay, which is basically measuring the distance of each point X, right, from the centroid of each of the classes, right? So what are you doing? You, so uh, le let me actually draw a picture, right, to show, show what's being done, right, and, and then I'll explain. All right, so you have a bunch of classes, all right? So let's say, for example, let's say there, let's say there are three groups here, right? Uh, let's say three classes, C, C1, C2, and C3, right? Now you pick, for C1, you pick some centroid here, okay? C2, you pick some centroid here. C3, you pick some centroid here, right? Now, if you're looking at new points, all right, you're going to put them in a particular class, 
depending on the distance from the centroid, right? So there will be this line, right? There will be, there'll be this line between this centroid here and this centroid here, right? Going halfway through it, right? So if a point falls over here, it'll, be, it'll belong to class C3, right? If a point falls here, it'll belong to class C2, right? So you see that? And then, again, between C1 and C3 also, you will have a line that will partition, right? So that's the decision boundary. So this is called the Voronoi pa partition, right? So you will make up a Voronoi partition, right? Based on the choice of those centroids, okay? So you have a number of classes, maybe here some more classes, all right? So, so the, the line that is going through the middle, that is equidistant from those two centroids, all right? That is going to be the de decision boundary, all right? So the idea is once you have the centroids correctly figured out, right? I would be able to, you know, decide uh, which uh, cluster each point belongs to, right, based on this Voronoi partition. Is that clear to everybody, right? So this, this is the thing that I just wanted to explain. It's very intuitive, right? So now, how do you write that in, in the form of an algorithm? So, so here you envision clusters that are formed by points X, right, generated by a random sample S, from a mixture of M circular Gaussian conditional distributions, right? Then the points A0S, A1S, up to AM minus 1S, right? These are the uh, possible choices for the centroids, right? And what are going to be the good values? The good values are the ones for which this metric is going to be minimized, okay? Well, it, what is this metric measuring? See, here you look at this, all right? This is the Euclidean distance between X and the Jth centroid, right? You're squaring that, right? And you're taking the minimum because you're going to put X in, in the cluster that corresponds to the nearest centroid, right? So you're taking that distance, minimum over all, all the different classes, right? Distance from the centroid square, right? And then you add that together over all the points, right? All the points that you have in the sample, right? And then you uh, divide it by the total number of points in the sample, right? So this is the cardinality of the set S, right? So, so the, the set of points here, these centroids, that minimizes this distance, right? That would be a good choice for the centroids, right? I mean, intuitively, you think that is the case, right? Because you're trying to put this into different clusters, all right? But you don't even know where to start. It's like a chicken and egg problem, all right? Like, you don't have the centroids, so you don't know where to start. So you have to choose the centroids, all right? But what are the best centroids? The best, the best centroids are the ones for which this quantity is going to be minimized, right? So, so the points A0 up, up to AM minus 1 uh, uh, superscript S, which minimize this distance, they are a reasonable choice for the centroids of the M classes that are arising from the conditional distributions. Agree? Does that make intuitive sense? Or? So now, so uh, suppose you have these centroids, then you can think of the Voronoi partition that I showed you in that diagram a short while ago, that V equal to V1 through Vm be the Voronoi partition on Rd that is induced by A0, A1, all the way up to AM minus 1, everything superscript S. Right? Then a point is going to lie in that partition VK if its distance to that corresponding centroid is no more than its distance to any other of the points, uh, to any, any uh, other of the centroids for the other, other clusters. Right? That's the idea. Right? So for Euclidean distance clustering, these sample points are going to be clustered according to how they fall into the Voronoi partition. Right? Makes sense. Something, we haven't proved anything. Right? This just makes intuitive sense. Right? Seems like a reasonable thing to do. Right? Now, the problem, the problem is that you have to know where the centroids are going to be, right, number one, right? And, uh, of course, you have to know the number of classes also a priori, right? How many, cl how many clusters you're looking for? Is it two clusters? Like that example, if you remember, was it two clusters or was it three clusters, right? So those are the two issues, right? Now, direct implementation of this Euclidean distance clustering is, is computationally prohibitive because if you, if you go back to this, all right, I don't know where the centroids are, okay? I have to pick them, then I have to do all this minimization, right? So computation needs going to be very intensive, right? So it's something easy to state, like in a lecture like this, all right, that this is exactly what you're going to do, right? But it's like a chicken and egg problem. How do you find out those points, all right? So to avoid that, you try an iterative procedure, right? So a classical iterative approximation is given by the k-means algorithm, right? Here you, you have k classes, and as I said before, you know, although we are assuming that yeah, somewhere along the road, oh, they switched from M to K, because I, I think 
the means are being called m, so we switch from m to k, right? So it would have been better to ha start with k in the beginning, right, instead of m classes. So a classical iterative approximation is given by this k-means algorithm, where k refers to the number of clusters provided by the algorithm. So each sample, so initially you are going to have to seed those means, right? So the k-means, you are going to, so those are going to be the centroids. Then that will de decide, uh, or, or that will dictate a Voronoi partition, right? Then you will partition all the points, right? into these different classes. Then once you have these, all the points in a particular class, you can recompute the centroid, right? The centroid is like the center of gravity, right? You can recompute and then use the new centroids for, for re repeating the same procedure, right? So each sample point is placed into a unique cluster during each iteration and the means are updated based on the classified samples, right? So given a sample S with N points to be placed into K clusters, initialize the algorithm with K of the means, right? You can pick any of those values, M1 through MK, among those points, then for each point x in s, x belonging to that sample, you calculate the distance from x to each of these means, right? And you form clusters C1 through CK by pla placing this sample point x into cluster C1, uh, into CI, if the, the Euclidean norm of x minus mi, right, is less than norm of x minus mj, right? And then once you, once you have come up with these clusters at this particular step, you can compute the new means, right? By just looking, by calculating the mean of the, of the points that you have in that sample, right? And then you'll repeat the procedure until the means do not change, right? Until the means do not change that much, right? Now, I mean, there, to my knowledge, there's no theoretical proof of this, right? But it works pretty well, right, in practice. So there are two problems here, right? First, if you're going to use this k-means algorithm, right? There, there are two issues that you'll run into. First, you have to, uh, uh, you know, you have to know a priori how many classes you're going to have, right? Right. And then the second thing is you need the choice of the means to get the algorithm started. You have to decide which ones are going to be your uni initial means, you know, and depending on the choice that you make, you know, things could, could be different, right? So one way to avoid this is, is to use what is called the fuzzy k, fuzzy means, fuzzy k means algorithm, right? Which I'm going to discuss next, right? So for the k-means algorithm, at each stage, the clusters are determined by the Voronoi diagram that is associated with the means that you have at that stage, right, m1 through mk. And two evident problems with this algorithm are the prior assumption on the number of means, right, that you're going to need, and the choice of the means to seed the algorithm, to get the algorithm started, right. And to get around the, the choice of the means, you can use what is called the fuzzy k-means algorithm, right. And how do you come up with the fuzzy k-means algorithm, right. So the starting point will be this equation, right, which I'm going to show you is really the same thing as, the, as what we had before. Same, it's a, well, not the same thing, it's a generalization of what we had before, right. So earlier on, right, for the k-means, we were trying to find the centroids, right, to minimize this function here on the right, okay. What is this measuring, right? So he, here, in the case of k-means, the assumption is that each point is going to belong to a single class or a single cluster, right? That's the assumption that you're making. So this thing inside, right, you're trying to find the distance from x to the closest centroid, right? So really what you're doing is you're basically measuring the distance from the point x to each of the centroids and then picking up the closest one, right? So I can rewrite this quantity. Instead of computing the minimum, right, I can rewrite this as you know, this distance square, right, multiplied by the probability that x belongs to the class Cj, right, because here we are assuming that each point can belong only to one cluster, right. That means the probability of x belonging to class Cj, it is either 1 or 0, right, for each of the classes, right. So if I do that, right, then I will, so if I put in another summation here, multiply this by probability of x belonging to class Cj, and then I sum up, I will really pick up only the minimum, right? Because that's the one to which the that that x is going to belong, right? Okay. So this same expression, right? I'm writing it a little bit differently. Instead, I, I'll st instead of putting it this, the minimum here, I'll sticking a stick in a second summation and multiply by probability that x belongs to class C J, right? And to make this algorithm more general, I will raise that probability to the power of b, right? Right? Just B is going to be an additional parameter that I will, uh, that I can pick and choose. Any questions on that? So 
no, no, it is still discrete because it's going to be a summation, all right? Uh, I mean, like, so in this case, you either have probabilities because you have one, right? So in other general case... Yeah, in, yeah, in the general case, each of those probabilities, you know, will be between 0 and 1, all right? So here, this, this extreme case, it's not fuzzy, all right? So the probability of x belonging to class Cj is either 0 or 1, all right? It is 1 for only one value of j, all right? zero for all the other values, right? In the other case, the probability of uh, x belonging to cj will be a number between zero and one, and the probability of x belonging to cj, when you sum that up over all the j's, it should equal to one, right? That's the difference, right? Any, any questions so far? So now, so that same expression over there, right? We are generalizing it here, right? So, uh, equation 1 can be rewritten like this, right? We, of course, in the case of equation 1, this b, uh, well, I mean, the b could be either, uh, it could be any number, you know, because uh, this quantity is either 0 or 1, all right? Probability that xi is in cj is the same as the conditional probability of the of the class class cj given xi, right? Given xi, you want to say which, which class it came from, all right? So that probability will be either 0 or 1, right, in the case of the k-means algorithm. So the same metric, we are now writing it out like this, right? Uh, so replacing the minimum with this summation, right? So here, pro probability that uh, the conditional probability of Cj given Xi is the probability that the point Xi is in class Cj, which is either 0 and 1, and it is 1 only for the minimizing J of equation 1. So everybody with me on this? Right? So now a fuzzy approach is going to result from letting these conditional probabilities reflect uncertainty, right? So that cluster inclusion is not crisp, right? We are saying that each point can belong to different clusters with certain probabilities, all right? And letting b greater than zero be a parameter affecting the degree to which a point can belong to more than a single cluster. So this is just a design parameter, right? And obviously, because these guys are conditional probabilities, all right? So you have a new point xi that has to belong to one of the one of the clusters, all right? One or more of the clusters. And so, if you're looking at probabilities, those probabilities need to sum up to one, so that is the constraint, right? So now you will do a constraint minimization problem, right? You will minimize this this guy subject to this constraint, right? So what method do you use for doing that kind of constraint minimization? Come on, somebody. I mean, like, you're all double E's, okay? What method is used for doing constraint minimization? Lagrange multipliers, all right? And this is an exercise. You don't have to do it for, for me here, right? But if you take the pattern recognition course, they'll probably ask you to do the, that minimization. So use the method of Lagrange multipliers, all right? Minimize this, all right? And then the solution that you will get will be an update formula for the means, all right? And also an update formula for these conditional probabilities, all right? And that's on the next slide, all right? So let P sub J denote the prior probability of the Jth class. Since the conditional probabilities are not uh, estimable, all right, or you cannot estimate them, and are heuristically set, we, we view them as fuzzy membership functions, right? Because the probability that xi belong to cj, right, we'll assume, assume that that's like a fuzzy membership function, right, to membership uh, function for, for belonging to those different clusters, all right? So in this case, for the minimizing values of this function that we have, the partial derivatives with respect to aj and p satisfy del rho s, del aj equal to zero, del rho s, del pi equal to zero, right? After you've added the stuff with the Lagrange multiplier, and then when you take the partial derivative, you will get this as the solution. This is the formula for updating the means, all right? And this is the formula for updating the, 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 the probability of xi being in class cj, right? So you're going to alternately apply this. So first, let's say you started with some means, all right? You plug them into this formula, right? You got your probability of xi in cj, right? At the next step, you will take that, all right? And calculate the new means, right, from here. And then you keep on repeating this procedure, right? So update, update MJ, update probability XI and CJ. Keep on doing until these things don't change too much, right? Now again, I mean, has convergence been proved? I don't, I don't think so. You know, to my knowledge, not. But I don't work in this area, right? But this method works pretty well. So these lead to the fuzzy k-means iterative algorithm. So you will initialize the algorithm with B, right? Uh, with, with some value of b, that's the parameter that you choose, then k means m1 through mk, and the membership functions, probability that xi is in cj, you'll give it some in initial membership function, right? And then, uh, of course, the membership functions have to be normalized so that they sum up to 1, right? 
then you'll recompute mj and probability that xi and cj from those two formulas that I've given you, right? And then you'll repeat until there are only small pre-specified changes in the means and membership functions, right? And the intent of fuzzifying the k-means algorithm is to keep the means from getting stuck during the iterative procedure, right? Because you, there is a possibility that you can leave that particular class and get out. Right? And then once you have, once you finally have the means, right, the partitioning is going to be just based on the Voronoi diagram corresponding to the means, the Voronoi partition. All right, any questions? So then we move on to another method that is also used, right, that's called self-organizing maps, but, you know, they, in order to explain this, it's going to be a little, a little bit more mathematically intensive, so I'm not going to get into that, I'm just going to let you know that this actually gives you another, yet another approach for updating the means of those different classes. Right? You're trying to break it up into clusters, all right? so it's called a self-organizing map because if you update those means, then you're going to get those different classes right, or clusters right, that will partition the data. Right? And that formula is given here. See, the, you will update uh, the mean at the ith, ith uh, stage according to this kind of a relationship. Right? So there's a correction term that you're going to use, right? And there's a mathematical basis for that. But again, I'm not going to go into the details because this is kind of a little bit more difficult to explain and we'll get a little bit lost in the math. It's not that difficult, right? But given our time constraints, right? We don't want to dig too deep into this, right? I mean, this is also a pretty widely used method. And the clustering, again, once you have the mean for that class, right? Or, or that cluster, clustering is achieved in the same manner as in the k-means algorithm with the cluster is determined by the Voronoi diagram that is associated with these means at, at the th time point. Okay. All right, any questions? So we have looked at uh, k-means, we've looked at fuzzy k-means, right, in quite a bit of detail, right, and you guys now understand what the algorithms entail, all right. The next thing that we want to look at is hierarchical clustering, right. Now, if you look at k-means and fuzzy k-means, these are based on what is called Euclidean distance clustering, right? Because uh, you, you put points into a particular cluster based on the Euclidean distance from the centroid of that cluster, right? That's what you did, right? So another approach is to iteratively join clusters according to some similarity measure, right? So if there's some similar, if, if there are two clusters that are pretty close, I combine them into one, right? How close is pretty close? Well, I have to define that, right? And there has to be some metric that is uh, able to accurately capture the intercluster distance, right? So in general, hierarchical clustering algorithm is given by the following procedure. You will initialize, so initially, let's say you have n, n different points, okay? So you can say each point is a cluster, right? By itself, right? And then now points which are close together, you'll group them together, right? So initialize the clusters by uh, capital C sub I, these are just singleton clusters, all right? And uh, by, a, uh, by a desired final number k, k of clusters, all right? And then you will proceed to iteratively merge the nearest clusters according to the similarity measure until you're left with only k clusters, right? And alternative is to continue to merge until the similarity measure satisfies some criterion, right? Some criterion, like the similarity measure, it, you know, uh, these clusters are not that close anymore to merge together, right? Something like that, right? And the merging process can be pictorially represented in the form of what is called a dendrogram, right? Where joined arcs represent merging, right? And as stated here, the hierarchical clustering is agglomerative in the sense that the points are agglomerated together into, into growing clusters, all right? And you will see, like if you look at the diagram, all right? Actually, I think I probably have that later. Yeah, this is an example of clustering, all right? See, like things are being grouped together, right? If two clusters are grouped together, then you have this kind of diagram. This is called a dendrogram, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, in a few minutes. But first, let me tell you what are the what are the different uh, metrics that are used to measure cluster similarity, right? So one possibility is to, you know, put each point in a separate cluster and then start mer merging clusters together, right? Another point is to think of the whole thing, right? All the points as one big cluster and then start dividing, right? So one can also consider divisive uh, clustering in which beginning with a single cluster, the algorithm proceeds to iteratively split, split up the clusters, right? 
Now, various similarity measures have been proposed, right? The popular ones are the minimum, maximum, and average measures, right? And these are, again, very intuitive. No rigorous results, right? But everything is very intuitive. So here, the distance between two clusters, CI and CJ, is measured by the minimum distance, right, that you get when you compare the points in the two clusters, okay? So measure the distance of each point from cluster 1 to cluster 2, right? And then take the minimum distance that you get as the distance between the two clusters. That's one possibility. Another possibility would be to use the maximum distance between the cluster, right, between the points in the clusters. Yet another possibility would be to take all the distances that you get, right, between the uh, pairs of points in the two clusters, right, and then average out the distances, right, because you'll have a total number of uh, cardinality of CI times cardinality of CJ, right, that many distances in the summation, so just average it out. So you can use either of these, right? Now, if you're doing hierarchical clustering using the minimum distance, right, that means the first one, that is called nearest neighbor clustering. And if you stop that clustering when the distance between the nearest clusters exceeds a pre-specified threshold, because if the distance is more than some number that you specified, you don't want to merge them together. You want to stop because then the clusters are dissimilar, right? So then it is called single linkage clustering. Again, that's just terminology, right? And given a set of clusters, at any stage of the algorithm, it is going to merge the clusters that possess the nearest points, right? And if we view the, uh, anyway, don't worry about the spanning tree and all that stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, don't, don't worry about all of this stuff. This is not, not a course on clustering, right? So let's move on to the next slide, right? Another type of clustering that you can have is what is called the farthest neighbor clustering. That will result when you start using the maximum distance. I gave you a minimum distance, all right? Maximum distance, all right? And also the average distance, all right? So you can use any of these, and you know the corresponding clustering algorithm will have the following name, all right? So if this halts when the distance between nearest clusters exceeds a pre-specified threshold, then this is called complete linkage clustering, right? And given a set of clusters at any stage of the algorithm, it is going to merge the clusters for which the greatest distance between points in the two clusters is minimized, right? And finally, if the algorithm halts when the average distance between nearest clusters exceeds a pre-specified threshold, then it is called average linkage, linkage clustering, right? So we have uh, farthest neighbor clustering, nearest neighbor clustering, average linkage clustering, right? Just use a different distance for, for carrying out the clustering operation. Any questions? Right. So this is an example of a class, and, and this is one of the early papers, you know, I forget which year, you know, but probably in the 2000s, all right, maybe early 2000s, when people had this <clears throat> gene expression data, right, and they were trying to cluster, let's say, tumor samples, all right, based on gene expression data. So here, there, al along the vertical direction, right, there, there is the expression pattern for 24 genes, right. This red is, uh, I think, uh, upregulated, right. Just let me make sure that red is upregulated and green is downregulated. Yeah, red is upregulated, up right? And green is uh, downregulated. All right, this is called like a heat map, all right? Because, base, because this, this is for ease of vi visualization, right? By looking at this picture, if you know that red means high upregulated, right? So if, if this is red here, it means the corresponding gene is upregulated, right? I, in that particular sample. Right, whereas the gene, uh, the corresponding gene, if you take from here, if, if it's green, right, that means in the, in this particular sample that gene is downregulated, right. So here you have clustered. See, there is clustering of the genes also, right, into different groups, right. This is hierarchical clustering, right. So you're grouping them together, and then uh, you can also cluster these tumor samples. So this is one kind of cancer, right. One kind of lymphoma, all these in red, they, all these in green is another kind of lymphoma, right. And so you have used microarrays, right, to look at the expression patterns of these 24 genes across those uh, 30 samples, I believe, for the 30 patients, right? And now you're able to separate it out. How? Because you can see that for these uh, genes that are marked in red, right, for these guys, the expression is higher, right, for these, uh, for one class of, of tumors, right, and lower for the other class, right? On the other hand, for the genes at the bottom, the by and large, right, the expression for, for these genes is higher for this other class of tumors as compared to this one, right? 
So you have been able to carry out some kind of clustering or, or separation, right? Not only that, if you're going to classify between these two tumors, all right, the clustering might give you, remember, we had thousands of genes on the microarray. We do not know which set of genes to use for the classification, all right? Here, maybe you can, uh, you can design a classifier based on two variables, all right? Two genes, all right? One selected from the red, right? And one selected from the green because you're seeing similar patterns, okay? For the red ones, these fellows are being expressed at a higher level. For the green ones, these guys are being expressed at a higher level, right? So just by picking one from here, one from here, you might get feature selection. So these genes have been hierarchically clustered and it appears from the figure that the red label genes are upregulated for MCL and downregulated for uh, DLBCL. These are two different kinds of lymphomas, whereas the green label genes are upregulated for DLBCL and downregulated for MCL. Thus, the different gene clusters seem to classify the lymphomas, right? They're breaking them up into two classes, all right, and, and correctly, right? So more precisely, the clustering might provide feature selection in the sense that actual classification might be accomplished by a two-gene feature set one red label and one green label, which is what I just pointed out. Now, these things were extremely hard in the early 2000s, okay, because, you know, microarrays came in the mid-90s, right? But then you're showing that you can do classification based on microarray data, right? So some of these figures, they are, and even the one that I showed you earlier, right, for breast cancer classification, those are, those are uh, from papers that are published in pretty high, very high-impact journals like Nature, Science, New England Journal of Medicine, and so on, right? Because the first time you show that, okay, I can do, and even today, okay, if you, if you have something new, right, then you could probably, something really new and, uh, you know, very surprising, you could probably try to publish in those journals. It, it's difficult, but that's very high impact. Like if you're talking about IEEE journals and all these, probably have like two, three, maybe four, okay, even the transactions and all, these other journals, their impact factor is very high because a lot more people look at it, like maybe 30 or something like that, right? So these are from, from those kind of journals, right? I'm not saying that that means that this is something like a lot better than, let's say, your Viterbi algorithm or something like that. That's been used in a lot of places, okay? But because it's very new, right, bef before anybody else has shown it, right, so it gets, le uh, it gets a, a lot more visibility. All right, any questions? Now, again, I mean... The design of a clustering algorithm again it's high, you know it's uh, heuristic right because we have the fuzzy uh, the k-means the fuzzy k-means self-organizing maps you might come up with your own algorithm and do it okay so there is heuristics involved okay how good is the clustering again th that question comes up all right i mean if i use a cl clustering algorithm how good is that going to be now in order to evaluate that you need to know what the true partitioning of that data is like in this case we knew because there were two different tumor samples, right, that were coming from different kinds of lymphomas, right? So, but in, in many cases, you will not even know what the true sample is, right? So how do you, do, how do you assess how good your clustering algorithm is, right? And intuitively, what they do, right, is basically, like, so you can have two things, okay? One is it's based on prior information, right? Like, like what I showed you here, that you know the tumors are, are in different classes, right? So that is one kind of validation, right, that you can do. Another kind would be just based on the data, right? So if you have a clustering algorithm, right? Let, let's say you're comparing two clustering algorithms, right? You, and, and let's say one of them is a good algorithm, right? So then you apply the, the same data, right? You, or, or you apply the two algorithms to the same data, right? You'll get different clusters. Now, if you, if you take pairs of points, right? They should fall in the same cluster. Now, if you use a different algorithm and, you, and the two points are falling in, in uh, they are behaving differently, right? In the case of the second algorithm versus the first one, then there is a problem, right? So you will, uh, one approach would be you try to count the number of mismatches that you are getting, right? And that would be a measure of how good your uh, clustering algorithm is. Again, not a perfect measure, a lot of hand waving, right? But it's still something is better than nothing, right? So again, I mean, all this stuff can be laid out quite formally. So a clustering algorithm operates on the point set as a whole by partitioning it, its error is based on the accuracy of the partition. So essentially, if you assume the points come from different distributions, label them accordingly, and match the result from the clustering algorithm with the subsets of the partition in the best way possible, then the error is the number of mismatches, right? But again, to calculate all this error with all these distributions and all that, you have to be working 
in the theory of random sets, right? And and that is more difficult than working just with random variables, right? Even with random variables, what happened? Okay. Didn't didn't the screen go off momentarily? I don't know what, what caused it, but it came back, huh? What happened? This is a random perturbation or what? <laughs> yeah, this just goes to prove that everything is stochastic. Huh? So. so the error of a cluster operator can also be defined in the context of random point sets in a manner similar to classification error. And uh, again, I mean, as, as I said before, you know, that is going to require a lot of heavy duty mathematics that even I myself am not familiar with. We don't have the time to get into that, right? But you know, if you're interested, I can give you references that you can go and read, right? If you're interested in, in the rigorous theory of clustering. So here, we are not going to get into that. Instead, we will look at some of the uh, measures, the heuristic measures that people have used for evaluating the quality of clustering, right? So, uh, so heuristic criterion can serve to give some indication of how the cluster operator is performing on the data at hand relative to some criterion. We will consider some methods that address the validity of a clustering output or compare clustering outputs based on heuristic criteria. These can be roughly divided into two categories. Internal validation methods evaluate the re resulting clusters based only on the data. Right? External validation methods evaluate the resulting clusters based on pre-specified information. Like in the case of those lymphomas, you know that they are two different types of lymphomas. So that, so that would be like external val validation. So external validation involves a criterion based on the comparison of the clusters produced by the algorithm and a partition chosen by some other means, some other clustering algorithm, right? I'm sorry, by some other means, maybe with prior knowledge, say one produced by the investigator's understanding of the data. One criterion can simply be the number of mismatches, which provides an empirical error. Okay, how many mistakes are you making, right? So this would be for ex external validation, right? So if we were to randomly generate a set S of points and partition according to an underlying distributional model, then we would have a single sample estimate of the error of the clustering algorithm relative to the distributional model. However, in the present situation, we don't have that, right? Because all this probabilistic stuff and all that, we don't have, have that. That's a research area. If you're going to do research in that area, you get in there. That's not for the genomics thing, right? So let's not worry about that. Instead, let's look at a situation, right, where we're looking at internal validation, right? And uh, we have, uh, let's say, two different partitions. Okay, one is uh, uh, one is p sub s and one is p sub zero, right? So we want to see now how uh, you know good are these two partitions, right, with respect to each other, right? And if one of them is the ground truth, then we have the absolute knowledge, okay? And we can say that okay, the clustering algorithm that I have is not that good because it's not measuring up to the ground truth, all right? But in general, you won't have that, but you'll use two different approaches, right? And you'll define four quantities over here to, to measure the goodness of the clustering. So you have A is the number of pairs of points. You'll take pairs of points, okay? So if, if both the clustering operators are do, doing an equally good job, all right? If I take two points here, right? And one of, one of the operators maps them into different clusters, all right? The other one also should do the same thing, all right? On the other hand, if one of the operators maps both these points that I've chosen into, the, into one cluster, I do, I, hopefully I won't see those two points showing up in different clusters in the other one. Okay, again, intu an intuitive idea. All right, so A is the number of pairs of points in S such that the pair belongs to the same class in, in, in the clusters created by these two different algorithms, in PS and also in P zeta. B is the number of pairs such that the pair belongs to the same class in, in PS in one of the partitions but in different classes in, in P zeta, right? So A is good, B is not good, right? C is the number of pairs such that the pair belongs to different classes in PS and the same class in P zeta. Again, that's not good. D is the number of pairs in S such that the pair belongs to different classes in PS and different classes in P zeta, right? Now, if the partitions were to match exactly, then all the pairs will be either be in A or D, right? C and D are going to, uh, C and uh, B and C are going to be zero, right? I, if both the algorithms are really good, right? So, so then, you know, based on, on this intuitive notion, you can define what is called the RAND index, which is defined by A plus D over A plus B plus C plus D, right? 
So if B and C are zero, that means the, both the algorithms are doing an equally good, good job, right, producing the same partitions, then you'll get a value of one, right? So the RAND index lies between zero and one, right? On the other hand, if everything is, I mean, there's complete mismatch between the two clusters, all right, that are produced by the algorithms, then uh, A, uh, A and D will be zero and you're going to get zero, right? Now, typically, a heuristic measure is defined to indicate the goodness of the clustering. Again, I mean, clustering does not have any rigorous basis like classification, right? So we have to basically live with whatever is out there in the literature, right? So it is... Now, a common heuristic for spatial clustering is that if the alg your clustering algorithm is a good algorithm, if it produces tight and widely separated clusters because you're trying to get groups if the groups are widely separated right but the spread inside the group is not too wide right that's probably good clustering right so that's the notion right so you can we consider two indices that are based on this heuristic right uh, so let uh, p made up of s1 s2 up to sn be a partition of the set the, the sample points s that you have and let's look at the distance between these uh, these partitions, these uh, potential clusters, SI and SJ, right, be a between cluster distance, and let sigma of SI be a measure of the cluster dispersion. That means inside the cl inside the cluster, how much of dispersion is there, right? So then you can define these indices, and these have been defined. One is called the Davis-Boldin index. It is defined like this, all right? The Davis-Boldin index for this partition, it basically has got. Uh, it's considering two aspects. In the numerator, you have the you have the spread of the ith cluster, right? You want that to be small. If the clustering is going to be good, the spread of that cluster should be small, right? Or the dispersion of that cluster. Similarly, the spread of the jth cluster should be small, right? And then you divide that. You normalize that by the distance between the two clusters, right? You want that to be large, right? I mean, that means the, cl the clustering is good. The clusters are widely separated. So that means, and, and then you're summing it up over all the possible, all the clusters that you have considered, the k clusters that you have considered, right? And you, you are taking the maximum value over j different from i, right? So c consider the two clusters, all right? And then compute this, all right? Do that for every pair of clusters, all right? Then take the maximum. So obviously, you want a small value for this quantity, right? If you have a small value for this particular index, that'll mean that the numerator is small, the denominator is large, which is exactly what you want, right? You, you want that the classes should be widely separated, right? and the dispersion should be small, right? So this is one index that has been used. Another measure is called the Dunn index, all right? And here you have the, uh, the cluster separation appearing in the numerator, right? So you want this to be large, right? The, cl the clusters are widely separated. And in the denominator, you basically want, uh, you basically have the dispersion, right? Or the spread within the class. You, you want that to be small, right? So a large value for this index is a good thing. So low and high values are favorable for alpha p and beta p respectively. And as defined, the indices leave open the distance. What distance are you going to choose, right, between the different clusters? Okay, you have freedom. I've shown you three different kinds of distances, all right? And also the dispersion measures and different ones have been employed. So if you want the classes to be far apart, right, an obvious choice for delta, that means the distance between the clusters, is that minimum distance that we, we discussed earlier, right? The, the, the distance between clusters is basically the distance between the closest points in the two different clusters, closest pair of points in the two different clusters. If you want tight classes, all right, an evident choice for, would be the diameter of that class, all right? That means basically you measure the distance from each point to every other point, right? And then take the maximum or supremum of that, right? So maximum of, of that distance. Now, these kinds of measures, they are intuitive, right? But they do not possess any predictive capability. It, it appears difficult to assess their worth, okay? I mean, like, how good is it? It's all very subjective, right? It's intuitive based on heuristics and very, very subjective, right? But there have been simulation studies to observe how they behave. And the danger of relying on heuristic validation indices has been demonstrated in a study that has shown weak correlation between many validation indices and clustering error across various clustering algorithms and random point processes. Okay. So this is not a, uh, they, like the algorithms that we have, you know, they work, right? In many cases, people use them, but it's not, uh, you know, 
based on solid theory, right? And that is the state of the art, right? And we are not working in that area, so we are not going to worry about that. And if we have a problem, we'll just pick up one of those, like maybe fuzzy k-means and then just run the cluster, clustering, right? And go from there. Okay, any questions on clustering? So again, here, uh, you know, if you want to put this thing on rigorous theory, there is probably some work out there, but it's, at the, it's, it, it's mostly in papers and all that, right? And, uh, you know, if you are going to become an expert in pattern recognition, maybe you would go and read those papers and see what's going on, right? But in general, you know, this stuff is not, uh, not that well figured out. You know? It's based only on heuristics. But uh, from the point of view of this course, right, like I'm interested in designing a classifier, right? based on gene expression, or I'm interested in clustering based on gene expression, right? And really, I mean, I don't want to dig any deeper into the theory of clustering, okay? So you guys are also probably happy because we don't have to go deeper into that, okay? But if you take the course on pattern recognition, maybe Dr. Bragonito will, okay, I don't know. Any questions? So if there are no questions, all right, then we'll move on to our discussion of genetic regulatory networks, all right? So see, I mean, like, we have looked at gene expression patterns on a microarray, right? And, uh, you know, we've figured out uh, a way of, uh, you know, assigning to each spot on the microarray a number like 1, 0, or minus 1, right? I mean, in, in the case where we did that ratio analysis paper, 1, 0, minus 1. So now, the, uh, and using that information, right, we can carry out classification because if you, if you give, uh, if, you, if you train the classifier, using a number of, of, of these microarrays, right? You've seen that pattern, one, zero, minus one. So in cancer versus, let's say, no cancer, right? Or stage one cancer, stage two, stage three, stage four cancer, right? So then when you're presented with a new sample, you can try to do the pattern matching or classification, right? And figure out where it falls and give some probability of the error, right? Which is the error estimation involved, right? So that's one thing. So we cover cl classification. Then we are also saying that you can do clustering also. Although, I mean, the, these algorithms, the clustering algorithms, they are basically heuristic in nature, but still you can do clustering. You can try, try to cluster these different samples together, right? And clustering is a way of, you know, because in classification, we need these prior classes, right? I mean, you, you want, like cancer, no cancer, right? Or cancer stage one. So clustering might be a way of generating those classes, right? And sometimes they refer to it as uh, unsupervised learning, right? If you talk about supervised learning, that's where they give you the classes, right, C1, C2, and so on, and then you're going to do classification, right? So that's kind of learning, right? Unsupervised learning means they didn't give you the classes, right? They just give you the data, and you have to figure out what those classes are going to be for your purpose, right? So here what we want to do is go a step further, right? We want to figure out, right, first, when you're looking at genes on a, on a microarray, right, if the expression patterns of some of the genes are going up and down together, right, maybe there's some relationship between them, right? So we want to figure out that relationship, right? So this is different. This is quite different from trying to figure out, you know, the relationship in engineering systems because engineering systems are man-made, right? We build those systems, right? So there are there is Newton's laws of motions, all kinds of physics and all that. So we may not, may not have perfect knowledge, right? But we build it, right? So we, so we can, uh, you know, easily figure out, uh, you know, some relationships and those things help us. Here, all you have is just some data. Right. You have data on the microarray, you did some experiments, you've seen some genes going up and down, right? So these are like some snapshots, okay? So does that tell you about how the genes interact with each other, right? So uh, it, it gives you some knowledge, all right, but not everything because you don't know all, all, all the connections, okay? So one approach might be if you see some genes going up and down together, right? Let's say you see some genes, like if this gene goes high, that one goes low probably there's some inverse relationship between them, right? Or if you have two genes that are going up and down together, maybe they are controlled by the same third gene, right? Those things are there. Now, in addition, right, the relationships between the genes, these are multivariate in na nature because we have seen when you have transcription, right? In the case of bacteria, it might be like one, one gene with, uh, you know, one activator or repressor. But in the case of the eukaryotic genome, there are a lot of different factors that are coming in, right? So these are multivariate relationships, right? So, and we want to find out these multivariate relationships based, let's say, on the microarray data, right? Now, the problem is that if you start from scratch, right, you have very limited microarray data, right? Because, 
like uh, for let's say a particular cancer, maybe you have 50 microarrays, then you have 10,000 genes, all right? So if you focus on one particular gene, okay, which, which are the genes that are affecting it the most, all right? It's going to be a difficult thing to find out, right? So what you might want to do is combine that microarray information with prior information that is available from the literature. Like the biologists have that, like they have, they have things that are called pathways, okay? It's not based on multivariate information, but they have done experiments. Like somebody did an experiment, they found out that if this gene is maintained high, then something downstream happens, right? So, and, and that information is out there in the literature. It is not perfect, right? It is curated uh, somewhat, or right? it is updated from time to time. Maybe you did an experiment, you got something. Somebody else got some other result, right? Then these are all put together, okay? So it's across many, many different samples, many, many different experiments done by different people, but that information is being uh, continuously updated, right? And there are databases, for example, one of them is called the CAG database, all right? It's the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, all right? And you can look that up, you know, after today's class that, so if you're in, interested in, let's say, studying, you know, some particular pathway, like let's say for um, glycolysis or let's say, in, uh, still, let's say pathways involving P53, because that's an example that we have looked at, right? Then that database will have this kind of information, right? That is already there. Again, it's not perfect information. It is also marginal information. Per perfect because some of those experiments you don't know, you know, under what conditions they were performed, right? So some of that data might be, might be faulty. It's similar to noisy data that you see in communications or in control, right? So, I mean, you, you have to be careful when using that data, but definitely it is out there. Okay, so there is some information out there. And then there is this information that you get from, can get from these microarrays or from next generation sequencing, right? That, let's say you do in your lab and you have new data, right? So uh, the key is you have to combine them in some judicious way, right? And we don't know exactly how that needs to be done, right? But you, so using, so th that is going to come later, like the combining in a judicious way. But let's say we had microarray data, all right? And based on that, I want to come up with genetic regulatory networks, all right? That means the patterns of interaction between the different genes, all right? So, I, so can, I, can I take the information on a microarray, all right? Let's say I have 10,000 genes, all right? Many of those genes, all right? Across different experiments, many of those genes, let's say don't change at all, right? So then I have no information to include them in, in a network model. But if, if there are some other genes that behave uh, differently across different experiments, all right? Maybe I can try to piece together that information and produce a model for interaction between the genes, all right? And to do that, right, we have to do, extend the notion of classification. Because see, classification, what were, we do, what were we doing? We had these two classes, like zero and one, right? And based on that feature vector, right, which could be the gene expression pattern, I was trying to put it into class zero or class one, right? Here we will extend that to what is called expression prediction, right? Where, let's say there are three genes, X, Y, and Z, right? If I see genes, if I know the expression pattern of X and Y, right? Can I make a prediction about the expression pattern of Z, right? This is like a classification problem where X and Y is like the feature vector, right? And Z is the class label that you're spitting out, right? In the case of the microarrays that we have discussed, the ratio analysis, there are three possible class labels, okay? Because each gene can be either upregulated, downregulated, or unchanged. So one, zero, minus one, right? And the key question is, looking at these other variables, X and Y, right? Can I make a prediction for that gene? If I can, Right? Or what is my ability? What is the ability for me to ma make a prediction for that other gene? Looking at these guys, okay? Do these genes convey extra information about that other gene? If, if they do, then there is some relationship, right? That's we, what we'll try to build up upon, right? And uh, there was another paper that I posted on eCampus, right? Which we have not discussed. Uh, you, uh, that is based on uh, what is called the coefficient of determination. I will discuss that paper. That paper will show you how you can go about building those kind of relationships, all right? The, the no notion of using some other genes, all right? Uh, some other set of genes to make a prediction about the gene that you're interested in. This is similar. I, I know many of you are in the communication area, all right? How many of you are in the communication area? Nobody is in the communication? Or you're all shy and hiding? Nobody has any communication background or? Your background you have, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that you're Viterbi, okay? You don't have to be Viterbi, but you at least know 
something about communications, okay, and all these random processes and all that. So this is going to be similar to, like if you have side information, right, you can do a better job, right, in, in predicting something. And I'm going to show you that the best estimate for a random variable, right, in the absence of any information is the mean, right? If you have information or, or data, right, then it becomes the, anybody? Conditional mean, yeah. So you know the stuff, yeah. So that, that's the notion that we are going to exploit. And again, for people who are not familiar with it, don't worry about it. I will explain everything from the basics, right? It will be the conditional mean, and we are going to use that to, uh, you know, come up with relationships or, or figure out relationships between genes and construct genetic regulatory networks. And then those networks also, it will lead to Markov chains and all that. I know some of you have taken Professor Kumar's course, all right? So we will get there, all right, pretty soon. Right. So... So the, the, the important thing to note here is that the genes interact with each other in a multivariate fashion, right? That's why a lot of times you will see maybe on CNN or ABC News that so-and-so researcher has discovered the gene for this cancer or this disease. Then uh, after a few years, you know, they do experiments, right? They knock out that gene. They do all kinds of things with that gene. Guess what? The cancer comes right back, right? Because it's a multivariate thing, right? You went and knocked out maybe one of the inputs for the AND gate. So the system figured out how to get around that, okay? All right, so let's, uh, so I just wanted to give you the big picture before starting the discussion here, right, on genetic regulatory networks. So any, any questions? So a central focus of genomic research concerns understanding the manner in which cells execute and control the large number of operations required for normal function and the ways in which cellular systems fail in disease. Okay, because if they don't do the normal function, that's when you're going to get disease, that's when you get worried about, right? Now, in biological systems, decisions are reached by methods that are exceedingly parallel and extraordinarily in integrated. Feedback and damping are routine, even for the most common of activities. All right, we've already seen the lack operon, right? If you remember, I, I talked about, well, not the lack operon, we talked about the tryptophan operon, if you remember, right? And again, if you don't, I mean, it's time to start studying for the next exam, all right? All those things are there, all right? Now, if you look at biological processes, okay, if you look at metabolism, that is like a linear process. And I will discuss some of that in this class, right? When I'm doing the plant biology, I will talk about, uh, you know, uh, plant uh, re respiration and photosynthesis, all right? Those are metabolic processes. They are linear processes because, you know, it's one step after the other. So if you want to study that process, it's relatively easy because it's not multivariate, right? Not, not completely multivariate. So you go and knock out one step, then you can see what has changed, okay? You can construct knockout experiments. So those things have been figured out, right? So traditional biochemical and genetic characterizations of genes do not facilitate rapid sifting of, the, of the, many of these possibilities to identify the genes that are involved in different processes or the control mechanisms employed. When methods do exist to focus genetic and, uh, and uh, biochemical characterization procedures on a smaller number of genes likely to be involved in the process, like in metabolism, right? Progress in finding the relevant interactions and controls can be substantial. In fact, the earliest understandings of the, mechanics, uh, of the mechanics of cellular gene control were derived in large measure from studies of metabolism in cells, okay? Again, metabolism is a combination of an anabolism and catabolism. It's not on the test, okay, but it's good. At least you remember that stuff, you know, because it's on the first, it was from the first test, okay? How you synthesize biomolecules and how you break them down, okay? Respiration I will be covering, right? And photosynthesis also I will cover in, in the context of plant biology. So in, metabol in the case of metabolism, it is possible to use biochemistry to identify the stepwise modifications of the metabolic intermediates and genetic complementation tests, okay? That means you can go and knock out something, right? to identify the genes that are responsible for catalysis of these steps. So the genes that are responsible for the catalysis of these steps, they will be producing proteins which are called what? Enzymes, yeah. So the enzymes that are responsible for the steps and those genes and cis regulator elements that are involved in the control of their ex expression. Well, cis regulator is a DNA sequence that controls the transcription of a related gene, right? Remember, we did those picture about for the eukaryotic gene, right? There were lots of things, okay, they were uh, th there was RNA polymerase, all right, then you had a whole bunch of transcription factors, then you had stuff that could be affecting the transcription from a distance and so on, okay. So those are cis-regulators, all right, cis-regulatory sequences. 
So in the case of metabolism, it's quite, quite well understood. People have been doing experiments on those uh, for decades, and you know, they've figured out the map, all right? But for, for like diseases like cancer and all that, things are a lot more complicated, right? And we don't know the complete map, and in cancer, everything is also messed up, right? First of all, we don't have the complete map, right? And then on top of that, if the interactions are messed up, that makes it even more difficult. So if you're looking at metabolism, starting from the basic outline of the process, molecular biologists and biochemists have been able to build up a very detailed view of the processes and regulatory interactions operating within the metabolic domain. All right, that's the reason why I'll be able to teach that to you. I said about respiration and photosynthesis. I can teach that because it's all figured out. It's there in textbooks and so on. So in contrast, for most cellular processes, general methods to implicate likely participants and to suggest control relationships have not emerged from classical approaches. And the resulting inability to produce overall schemata for most cellular processes has meant that gene function has been, for the most part, determined in a piecemeal fashion. Right? Like people went ahead and sequenced the entire human genome. Right? Let's say in 2000, right? so you've sequenced the, the 3 billion nucleotides. But what do, you, what do you do with that after that? Right? So you have the genes, but you don't know how to put together the pieces, right? Right? It, it's just like you got the hardware, right? And you don't have any software to run it. You don't know how, how everything fits together. Right? Now, once a gene is suspected of involvement in a particular process, research focuses on the role of that gene in a very, very narrow context. And this typically results in the full breadth of important roles for well-known, highly characterized genes being slowly discovered. And a good example of this is the relatively recent appreciation. Well, it's not recent anymore, you know, because this is like 10 years old, right? But this is the appreciation that oncogenes, again, onco what are oncogenes? Right, and they turn on cell division, right? So MYC is an example of an oncogene, right? But MYC also can stimulate apoptosis, right? Program cell death in addition to proliferation. Now, because transcriptional control is accomplished by a complex method which interprets a variety of inputs, we've seen a lot of transcription factors have to come and bind the RNA polymerase for eukaryotic transcription to start, right? So the development of analytical methods which detect multivariate influences on decision-making present in complex genetic networks is essential, right? And modeling and analysis of gene regulation can substantially help to unravel the mechanisms underlying gene regulation and to understand gene function. And this can have a profound impact on developing techniques for drug testing and therapeutic in intervention for effective treatment of disease. All right. So if I can figure, if I can find out, uh, or if I can figure out a genetic regulatory network, right, that is dis describing the, the b overall behavior of that system, all right, then perturbations in that network maybe lead to the disease. But if I understand that network, okay, how the signaling thing works, then probably I have a good chance of figuring out what kind of molecules I should use to go and you know, try to re restore the network to a, to, a, uh, to a condition, right, corresponding to a healthy situation, right? That's the idea, right? So here it's like we're trying to intervene in a genetic regulatory network, right, Ab about which we don't even have that much of knowledge, right? We are just seeing bits and pieces, right? That's what makes it challenging. This is different from trying to intervene in a, in a network, let's say in the control system of a car or something like that, because we put that together. We know what could break down and things like that, right? So it's a lot easier, but here it's different. But progress is being made. Right. So two, two salient aspects of genetic regulatory system must be modeled and analyzed. First of all, the topology, right, which is the connectivity structure. Which gene interacts with, with which other gene? Right? Let's say you have 10,000 genes. Right? If you don't know anything about the topology or structure, or, and let's say somebody tells you that uh, you know, at most, uh, let's say, two genes affect any other gene. Right? Are you going to go through the 10,000 choose two combinations, right? And, and then do, you know, to figure out all the different possibilities or exhaust all the possibilities. You know, that's a humongous problem to look at, right? So you need some knowledge about the topology and that may come from that prior information that is there in the literature. Like I talked about those databases and all that. It's not a, again, I mean, you cannot take that as, as the ground truth as being 100% correct, right? But if it's something that a lot of biologists have seen before you, Maybe there is some truth to it, right? Then the, also the set of interactions between the elements which determine the dynamical behavior of the system. So exploration of the relationship between topology and dynamics may lead to valuable conclusions about the structure, behavior, and properties of genetic regulatory systems. Now, 
numerous mathematical and computational methods have been proposed for the construction of formal models of genetic interactions. Because, you know, as engineers, we are used to, let's say, describing things with differential equations, right? So I might like to look at the gene activity at, at, at different points in time, right? And write down some equations. Okay, how does the gene activity evolve? Only problem, you need a lot of, you'll have a lot of parameters in those equations, okay? How are you going to find out those parameters? Right? So, or if you're a statistician, you're probably going to try to use some Bayesian network or something like that. Again, how are you going to get those conditional probabilities, right, that you need for de uh, defining the Bayesian network, right? So anyway, regardless of which model is used, right, to, to, to describe a genetic regulatory network, right, these models will share certain characteristics. First of all, they'll represent systems in that they characterize an interacting group of components, right, forming a whole. They can be viewed as a process that results in a transformation of signals, and that's where signal processing will come in, right, and they generate outputs in response to input stimuli, right. They are dynamical in that they capture the time varying quality of the physical process under study and can change their own behavior over time. And they can be considered to be generally nonlinear, right? Because in biology, things are nonlinear, right? The only linear thing is, is, is the meta response within the metabolic domain, right? So they can be considered to be generally nonlinear in that the interactions within the system yield behavior which is more complicated than the sum of the behaviors of the agents. Like if you have a linear system, right? If you, uh, the principle of superposition applies, right? So if you suppress one of the inputs, right, you get look at the output, then suppress this input, look at the output, put the two, two outputs together, you get the actual output. In biology, you don't get that, right? So these characteristics are representative of nonlinear dynamical systems. So nonlinear dynamical systems are going to be used to describe gene regulatory networks, right? How you map the biology to those nonlinear di dynamical systems, that's a different story, right? That will be using your microarray data, using next generation sequencing, using the pathway information that is available in, in these publicly uh, available databases, right? You have to use all of that and, and do it judiciously. So if you're looking at nonlinear dynamical systems, they are made up of, of states, right, which are the internal variables, inputs and outputs, right? signals, and then there'll be transition operators between different states and output operators. So if you've taken a course on control theory, you know what I'm talking about, right? You did it for linear systems. You're going to have states, right? Then you'll have a state transition matrix, right? And, and then uh, if you apply an input to the system, right? You'll figure out how that affects the output, right? So even for nonlinear systems also, you can do the same thing. So most attempts to model gene regulatory networks, they fall within the scope of nonlinear dynamical systems including uh, what are called probabilistic graphical models, right? Such as Bayesian networks, neural networks, and differential equations, right? And based on more recent evidence from genomics, nonlinear dynamical systems appear to provide the appropriate framework to support the modeling of genomic systems, right? Now, to build a model for a specific application, it will require abstracting from the specifics of the problem at hand. And you have a large number of choices, okay? You can use many... Like, there, there are many ways of modeling systems, right? You can use differential equations, you can do discrete time modeling, right? You can do hybrid modeling, you can use uh, Bayesian networks, and so on, right? Lots and lots of possibilities. What are you going to choose? Okay, how are you going to decide what model you're going to use, right? Uh, and many concepts relevant to genomic regulation have been characterized from the perspectives of mathematical theory, estimation of model parameters, and application paradigms. For example, structure, a biological system is inherently very robust, right? It has what is called structural stability, right? So it has the tendency to persist. For, for example, your blood pressure, right? It has to be regulated within tight limits, right? So if uh, you get really worried, your blood pressure might shoot up, but in a normal situation, it will come down, right? Or your blood sugar also, it has to be within some, some acceptable limits, right? It doesn't go at least in a normal person who's not sick, all right, is not going to go way out of whack, okay? It might go out there, but then it will come back. So there is some kind of structural stability or what is referred to as homeostasis, all right? So structural stability concerns the persistent behavior of a system under perturbation. It captures the idea of behavior that is not destroyed by small changes to the system. So it's very, very robust also, all right? So this is certainly a property of real genetic networks since the cell must be able to maintain homeostasis ability of living systems to maintain internal equilibrium in the face of external perturbations and stimuli. All right, so, so suddenly, like let's say it's freezing here, then it becomes really hot, 100 degree temperature, right? 
if you step out there, right, you shouldn't die, okay? Your cells in your body have to be able to adapt to keep your temperature at uh, whatever, 98.6 degree Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, all right? So, so there is a homeostasis and uh, the cells are able to, to maintain those variables, right? So there is a good amount of stability. Then there is also uncertainty relative to model behavior and knowledge acquisition has been extensively explored. Well, I mean, this just says, okay, over here, this is just saying that the tools are there, okay? We know what kind of problems we have to focus on, right? Similar problems engineers have looked at. For example, in information theory, you've used entropy and things like that, right? In control theory, you've figured out, uh, let's say, controllability, right? Whether the system is controllable or not. So if I get a genetic regulatory network, I would like to assess before trying to control it with a drug or something like that, right? Is, there, is this thing controllable from that particular gene, right? Things, so those ideas are already there. The theoretical ideas are there. The real challenge is to map the gap between the, the actual field and the theory, all right? Because the real test of all these methods, all right, is, is whether it ultimately makes a difference in cancer treatment, all right? It is not whether we build more sophisticated math. Even necessarily, we will do that, all right? Just like in, in communication, the ultimate test is whether we can communicate with each other through the cell phones or whatever, okay? And they have met that goal, all right? Here, the ultimate test would be if it is making a difference, all right? in, in uh, drug discovery or, you know, uh, prescribing a treating regimen, uh, a treatment regimen for cancer and so on, okay? So let's uh, stop here for today, right? And we'll continue next time.